Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. We're here at Bricks by the Bay, our local Bay Area Lego convention. And we're here with Jack Carlson. Now Jack, you had to remind me because it's been several years since we've been at Bricks by the Bay, but I've met you before. Yeah. Last time we chatted about your giant, uh, your, your rocket ship yeah, with the gantry. Yeah. Yeah, so that was the big Saturn V. I brought that to Bricks by the Bay in 2018. Oh my and God. It's been a few years, so uh, a lot of uh, time has elapsed since then to build even larger models. And yeah, today I have brought this massive minifigure scale Lego A380. Wow. Okay, there's a lot to go over here. First of all, minifig scale. Yes. So not only is this a uh, exterior, it, it is made to be filled with minifigs perfectly scaled from yes. cockpit to cabin. Yes, basically everything here is one to 40 of scale, which is minifigure scale, or at least pretty close to it. And it has a full interior, seven feet in wingspan, six feet in length. It weighs almost a hundred pounds. This thing is an absolute Goliath, especially when compared to some of the other models that I've made before. So yeah. it's huge. And the thing is freestanding. Yes, there's no metal support, no glue really in this. There's nothing, it's all Lego. It's Technic bricks, just system bricks, anything that Lego has made. And yeah, it holds itself together. It's a miracle. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, tell me about the construction, the, the engineering of it. Uh, you knew the form factor. Yeah. There's tons of reference, of course, mm -hmm. for this airplane. Um, there's you know hundreds of these oh, in operation. Yeah. But yeah. Tell, tell me how you go about designing something like this. Okay, yeah. So the first thing I'll do before I even start the project is I'll make a uh, blueprint. It's a top-down schematic and it's a scale schematic. So I'll just usually go onto Google and find whatever blueprint, usually the highest quality one I can find, and I'll print it out and it'll be full size, even, even the uh, front and side profiles. Okay. And that will help me get proportions, that will help me get general size, I'll know how wide the fuselage needs to be, I'll know how thick the wing needs to be. That's the first thing I'll do. And that's tiled sheets of paper, like printed out. Yeah, so it's, okay. it's just a regular size piece <laughs> yeah, of printer yeah, paper. Yeah. I just have a, a pretty cheap inkjet printer that just is able to do the job. Makes no, total sense. No industrial size uh, printers here, but. Uh, yes. So that's the first thing I'll do. And at that point, I will then make a wing box assembly. So this is like on a real airplane, it would be where the wing spars from both sides meet in the center. And this is really sort of the structural heart of the model because everything is connected to there. The landing gear are in that area. The right. wings slot into that space. If anything breaks, if that breaks, this thing will basically collapse. So I can't have that happen. And that's Technic, presumably. Yes, so most of that is Technic brick and some system involved. There are some system hinges, which allow the wing spars to be angled up to get a dihedral. Right, but the trick here is you're locked in by the, the, the blueprint of yes. the actual plane. Yes. You can't actually go into the cabin space for structure. No, I can't, yeah. So I need to leave enough space inside the model for a full interior because in my view, one of the funnest parts of building these is to have a fully detailed kitted out interior because people really enjoy seeing that when you open up the top and yeah. there's little people inside, which we can show later after we film this. But it's great because it's, it's one of the things that gives the plane character. And so one reason that I like building it because especially at the end of the build, I get to go in and put all the little details in and it's really what gives me the passion to build these. But yes, you are correct. Everything needs to fit inside the central wing box in the main front area underneath. And that is very challenging because in some cases there's very, very uh, small amounts of space to use. Mm -hmm. And you also have to have enough room for the landing gear wheel wells. So there needs to be basically big cutouts inside the central core of the model for the wheels to fold into because this model also has retracting landing gear. The oh undercarriage can completely fold in, the doors close. And it's really everything here on, as is on the real plane. It's basically as the same as it would be on the real plane. And even on this one, it's not really visible in today's show, but these flaps here and the spoilers are all motorized. Oh, so wow. So there are motors, yes, at the base of the wings. For actual flap movement. Yes, so there's an axle that runs up the length of the wing and there are linear actuators that can pull the flaps in and out. The uh, spoilers are attached to the little strings, so they'll, uh, <laughs> go up and down too with the flaps. And uh, that was one of the big things that I wanted to do. I have really good video of that that I've shot of this in a, in a clean white background backdrop. And it really, it's great. I can control it using the little powered up app. Oh my gosh. It's and RC it's in all that Bluetooth. Way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, where have you mentioned using a digital program for prototyping? No, Are I, you really just building taking apart, rebuilding to, to make a trial and error physically? Uh, yeah, so I don't really use any kind of AutoCAD or any 
you know, digital designing program before this, because especially with these large models, you just don't know whether the structure is going to hold up. Now, yeah. I know that structural like stress testing on the uh, uh, AutoCAD these days has come a long way from where it used to be. For simulation, I, yes. Yes, yeah. for simulation. But I still like to do it just with my hands and just to see, will it work in real life? Will it hold together? And that's the fun part with me, just being able to sit down if I have extra time, maybe in the evening, and just stick the bricks together and see what I can do, see what works. And I think that's really where I get enjoyment out of this, is just sort of tinkering with new designs and new techniques, rather than doing it as like a job that has to be, you know, or I have to do it and sit at a computer all day. So that's why I really like building these without using any digital assistance. Now, I will try to calculate how many of certain parts I need, so I don't just right. go into something like this completely blind. Like you can see that I make a, not sure if it's visible in the camera right now, but there is an outline for the fuselage. Yes, cross section, yes, right? Yes, a cross section. And that, those are great because I can estimate using that how many of a certain part I'm going to need. So yeah. if I know for every two studs, for instance, if I use 12 of a certain piece, I can extrapolate out that over the length of six feet, I'm going to need so and so of this, so many of this part. And it's not usually 100% accurate, but it's very close and sort of helps me sidestep the need for a uh, uh, AutoCAD program because it just sort of, it's sort of more rudimentary, if you will. It's more old school. And but then are you placing orders on BrickLink and, oh yeah. and, and just kind of bulk ordering more than you think you'll need just so you can yeah. uh, trial and error? So uh, this one I built on my YouTube channel between August and uh, August of 2020, and I believe it was like March of 2021. And the way I usually do it is I'll build a section and then I will hit a point where I need more parts or I need a certain type of part. And so I'll have to put a brick link order and I have to wait a week. Yep, and yep. then I get my parts, I, I put them on the model, I build a little further and I'm like, oh, I need more parts. So it's just sort of a step-by-step -step process. And this model is built in sections, right? So there's the main center section, which is really the most complex section. It's that's where all the landing gear is, all the motors, all it's the electronic heart of the model. There's a circuit board in there that controls all the lights. That's where all the motors were. I used to have all the batteries. Right now I just have it cabled into mm. so it can plug into the wall because it's a lot easier for shows and having sure. to switch batteries. Um, but that's what I really started with. And that was the biggest section. And I usually try to keep it pretty small to, for portability. But on this plane, it's just, since it's the largest passenger plane in the world, even the smallest section or the smallest that I can make it is still absolutely massive. So. Mm. And then the rest of the cabin, you know, you have your cross section, but it's not slices. You are building entire sections and placing a lower level and a, yeah. and a higher so level. Yeah. So I try to keep things about a foot, maybe a foot and a half in length mm. so I can fit it in a box. Got and it. This one is too big to fit in a suitcase, but usually I'll aim to fit them in a standard size care, or checkable suitcase so I can take it to shows that require getting on a plane. But uh, this <laughs> one, yeah, it's a little too big for that, but it's not too big that I can't bring it to shows otherwise because if this didn't break apart I would not be able to move it off of my work desk it's just it's absurdly heavy yeah it, you can't really there's no other way to move it other than to take it apart in sections in a modular fashion right so imagine the tail here comes yes. off and you said foot by foot wings come off but when plugged in still structurally standing oh yes I yes. see nothing actually supporting either of the wings. No, these wings are completely freestanding that again they all connect back to the central wing box and Thank God that thing is able to hold it up. At first, when I first built these wings, I was a little skeptical of whether they were gonna be able to hold, but thankfully I sort of over-engineered it. <laughs> so they're able to hold and it holds the dihedral very well, which is the slight upward pitch of the wings. And that was one of the challenging parts of this because I have experience from building a 747. Yeah. And from that, I know not only do the wings need a lot of support in the wing box, but the fuselage, in order to keep the fuselage from sagging, mm. there needs to be vertical Technic lift arms in the fuselage that help stop it from sagging. And it helps it also from s sandwiching apart. It's another wow. problem, especially if you want to re retain the modularity of this to be able to have it so you can take the top off and see inside. Yeah, then we're like, when Airbus you know, sells this to, to airlines, Airlines can kind of customize their interior, their layout. This is modeled with interior yes. after an Emirates, a real existing plane? Yeah, so I tried my best to base it off of a real Emirates plane. Now, obviously, the Lego figures are of a very odd proportion. They're a little yeah. wider than, than us. So in economy, I think it's a 242 where it should be 343. 
but you know, there's some compromises yep, that have yep, to yep. be made. I wanted the seats to look good. I wanted them to be as accurate as possible. So I had to uh, spread them out a little more. I know we all, you and me, wish that the uh, real airlines could have <laughs> a little more room for right, our right, seats. Right. But uh, yes, yeah, so it has the lounge in the back, the little, the space age lounge the Emirates is famous for. It has the two shower suites up front. Of course, I have the first class suites and each one of those first class suites has a lamp that is actually wired into the uh, uh, electronics of this plane. So when I flip the switch, all the lamps in each one of the first class suites turns on individually. Wow. And I wanted to do that on this one because it just wanted to convey the real sense of luxury that a plane like this really brings. Because this is, when you fly on this, I've, as I always say, it feels like you're in an Ikea warehouse that is <laughs> taken to the skies. So I wanted to really sort of give that just sort of convey that feeling to the person watching the video that this is really luxury. This isn't like one of these uh, sardine can planes that you and I might fly on. This is something that you pay for. It's, it's a lot. And you said electronics, obviously you said there's some articulating, you know, flaps, spoilers, but the lighting, they're not just self-lit bricks. They are wired together. So. Yes. So there is a circuit in the uh, heart of the model. It's down in the base of the wing box. It's an airplane circuit. So I actually got it from brick stuff. He does very nice lighting kits and uh, I cabled it in. It's a board that controls the flashing of the lights on the strobe lights on the top and the uh, collision lights as well, as well as the navigation lights on the tips of the wings. And they're all synchronized together. So when they blink, they all blink as they should. And in order to do that, I had to run cables through the fuselage. I had to uh, run cables all the way out from each of the sections to the tips of the wings. And it's, it's very it's a complex web of cables, but it manages. I, it's a, kind of a miracle that I was able to get this thing together for this show in time. Wow. But yeah, it's, it worked out. It is incredible. And, and you said you finished it about a year ago now, yeah. you know, in 2021. Have you gone back to take it apart and, and upgrade sections or is this considered uh, a finished model? I'll, the only part that I've really upgraded over since I completed it was the nose. Since I wasn't 100% satisfied with the nose at first, I went back and iterated on it and I'm much happier with how it looks now. It's more of sort of the bulbous A380 nose. Those of you who have been following it on YouTube may have noticed the change. But other than that, yeah, not a whole lot else has changed. Since I finished it, I basically just packed it up and have had it in storage ready for shows like this because if I leave this sitting out next to a window for too long, the sun yellow, will yeah, yellow, yellow the parts. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to sort of protect my baby here and uh, oh my keep, gosh. It, keep it yeah. in storage. And, and it's quite a thing to display oh, at yeah. home. <laughs> yeah, so. no, this would, <laughs> we had, I had to reinforce uh, the, the display table this was on. I had to put a fifth leg underneath it to keep it, the table from snapping in half because yeah. it was warping under the weight of it. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I need, I need uh, more support under this. Wow, is it a big sigh of relief after a show oh, yeah. like this where you have to bring it back home, yeah. check all the parts, no structural damage. We're then, all good, yeah. We're all good, <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. Well, Jack, it's such, so good to see you again. Yeah. Such an impressive model. Congratulations yeah, thank you on guys. a successful build and all the attention it's been yeah. getting. It's one of the most stunning things It's been really here. well received here at Bricks, by the way. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm glad. I could have brought it out. Yeah, yeah. what's uh, any teases for your next project? Is it Ooh. aviation or? Uh, yes, so the next one I'm working on is a uh, Kennedy Air Force One. So it's going to be a little bit smaller, a little smaller than this one, but it's gonna look really beautiful. It's going to complement my previous Air Force One. So it's going to be, have the full interior, of course, and lights and everything. So yeah. that's what we're looking at after this. A little bit smaller than this, but to be fair, this is the largest passenger plane in the world. So wow. it's uh, and whenever they bigger. make another one, then you'll be back to build that's, that's a, right. a 140th I'm, scale version of that too. <laughs> yep, that's right. If Airbus makes a bigger one or Boeing makes a bigger one, <laughs> I'll be on it. So, Awesome. Jack, yeah. good to see you again. Nice being able to talk with you as yeah. well. Yeah. Again, we'll have links to where people can find your YouTube channel yes. and this build uh, and have a great rest of the show. Yes, you too. Thank you for stopping by. Hey guys, Adam Savage from Tested here. If you've ever seen the six inch ruler in inches and centimeters on my forearm and wanted one of your own, but you didn't want it to be permanent, well, today's your lucky day. You can now buy temporary tattoos of my measuring stick, my measuring forearm uh, at tested-store.com. Comes like this, goes on in about 30 seconds with a little water. The instructions are on the back. It comes off with rubbing alcohol and hopefully it warms you up to the idea of permanently attaching a measuring device to your body because I use mine every single day.